Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It sounds like a strange question for an apostle to ask. But really, his train of thought follows very logically from the last few verses of Romans chapter 5. Perhaps it's helpful for me just to remind us all that the Bible wasn't originally written with its chapter and verse divisions. Those were added in hundreds of years later just to be helpful for us. And sometimes the chapter and verse divisions are very helpful. Sometimes they sort of mix it up. I don't think this is a bad way to divide the passage. But so often we have to understand verse 1 by taking a look at the last few verses of the previous chapter. So let me begin reading at verse 20 of Romans chapter 5. And I think it'll give you maybe even a little better idea of what Paul's talking about. Moreover, the law entered that, where the, off- that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul ended chapter 5 with the thought that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Now, Paul is wondering, I won't say that he's worrying, but he's wondering if someone might take this truth to imply that it doesn't matter how we live. It doesn't matter if we sin because where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. If I sin more, God will extend more grace unto me. I mean, after all, if God loves sinners, then why worry about sin? If God gives grace to sinners, why not sin more and then receive more grace? It's as if some people think that it's sort of their job to sin and it's God's job to forgive. And so I'll do my job and God can do his job. It sort of brings a question before us and it makes us wonder if God's whole plan of grace is safe. Maybe God has launched out on some risky plan that people will take advantage of and, and, and cheat. Do, do you remember after the, the Northridge earthquake in 1994, I believe it was? And it was absolutely astounding to see how many people cheated their insurance companies after that. How many people filed fraudulent claims after that? And they did it because they felt reasonably certain that they could get away with it. And at least humanly speaking, many of them did get away with it. They were never caught. And even now, they're enjoying the benefits of that money, even though they filed fraudulent claims. Well, it makes us think that, you know, if you give people an opportunity, they're going to take advantage of it. Well, has God done the same thing in his whole system of salvation? I love sinners. Jesus died for sinners. Well, then great. I'll just stay a sinner and receive your love. If God's salvation and approval are given on the basis of faith instead of works, won't we just say then, well, I believe and then live any way that we please. It's a real problem, isn't it? And I want you to notice something else about verse one. Now, what I'm going to explain to you right now about verse one isn't exactly clear In the English translation, where Paul says in verse one, shall we continue in sin? But in some ways, the language that Paul originally wrote in, it's an ancient form of the Greek language. The language that Paul originally wrote this letter in, in some ways, is a much more sophisticated language than English. It has verb tenses that we don't really have in English. And the verb tense that Paul uses for the phrase, continue in sin. If you're interested, the the verb tense is the present active tense. It makes it clear that Paul describes here the practice of habitual sin. In other words, the question he's dealing with here is, shall I go on living a lifestyle of habitual sin so that God's grace will abound to me? Now, if you're interested in the question of, What about occasional sin? Since God loves me, should I even care about occasional sin? Paul deals with that question beginning at verse 15. 
But I want you to understand that the question he's dealing with right now is, is God's grace greater than my stubborn or habitual sin? Paul's writing here about somebody who stays in a lifestyle of sin, thinking that it's acceptable so that God's grace will abound to them. The question is this. Should we continue in habitual sin so that we can have more grace? That's the question he's dealing with in verse 1. Well, let's look at his answer in verse 2. Certainly not. It's actually a very strong phrase that Paul writes there. It's it's perish the thought or away with the notion or you've got to be kidding. Get out of here is as if Paul's saying. He says, certainly not. And then please notice what he says next. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Paul says, my friends, it is unthinkable that any believer would continue in sin that grace would abound. Because when we're born again, when we have trusted on Jesus for our salvation, our relationship to sin is permanently changed. We've died to sin. Therefore, if we've died to sin, we should no longer live in it. It simply isn't fitting for for us to live any longer to sin if we've died to it. Now, dying is a significant change, don't you think? There's a significant difference between something that's alive and something that's dead. And some of you might be looking at verse 2, and and if you're honest with yourself, you scratch your head, and you say, died to sin. When did that happen in me? Well, Paul is going to explain that for us. What I want you to hear is what Paul says, is that in the life of the believer, there has taken place a transformation. That there's something different in the believer. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker that says, Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven? Now, I agree with the sentiment of that bumper sticker. The sentiment of that bumper sticker is, hey, I'm not Mr. Holier than thou because I'm a Christian. I don't think I'm all better than you and that, you know, I'm Mr. Perfect and you're Mr. Loser because I'm a Christian and you're not. I'm forgiven and that's a gift of God's grace. That's a wonderful sentiment. But I have to say that theologically, that bumper sticker is way off the mark. Because the difference between the Christian and the person who is not a Christian is not simply that one is forgiven and one is not. The Bible tells us that God does a change in our life when we're forgiven. That God transforms us. It's this simple principle. When God saves us, He transforms us. It's not as if the only difference between the believer and the person who doesn't believe is one's forgiven and one isn't. God says, this person has died to sin and this person hasn't yet. Now, that's a big difference. There's a transformation there. Now, Paul has a lot to explain about what it means to die to sin. As a matter of fact, the rest of our time together this morning, we're basically going to talk about that. Talk about what Paul means when he says died to sin. But the point is clear. You're dead to sin if you're a Christian, and it's just not appropriate that you live any longer in it. Friends, we don't live in in mausoleums. We don't live in crypts. We don't live in coffins. Dracula might go to bed every night in a coffin, but you or I guess she sleeps during the day in a coffin, but you understand the point. It's not for us. We're about living and living as we are, not the old life that's dead. There's come a change in our life, and we should live accordingly. Now, he's going to talk now about what illustrates our death. And that's verse 3. He says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. I love how Paul brings up and he says, or do you not know? You know, what's wonderful about that is it's it's like by implication, he's saying, hey, you you all should know this. 
Every believer should know this. I, I think that every Christian should have an active, working knowledge of the principles that Paul's trying to get across to us right now. And he says that as many of us as were baptized in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. You say, no, wait a minute. I, I know that I was baptized in water. What does it mean to be baptized in Christ Jesus? Let me take you back to what that word baptize means. You know, in the ancient world, when Paul first used it, in the vocabulary of the ancient world, it wasn't a religious word. It, it was just a word that meant to dip or to immerse something. They would talk about a piece of fabric. And if you wanted to put it in a liquid dye, you know, you have to put it down underneath the liquid dye and then pull it back up. They would say you baptized that that piece of cloth. If there was a cup and you wanted to, uh, you know, get water out of a bucket with the cup and you dipped the cup into the bucket, they would say you baptized that cup. It wasn't a religious word at all. And what Paul's saying is that when we were immersed or overwhelmed in Jesus Christ, then something happened to us. What? When we were immersed into Christ, we were immersed into his death. You see, the believer's water baptism or being baptized into Christ is a dramatic acting out of the believer's immersion or identification into Jesus And then notice, look carefully here, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. And then, verse 4 again, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. In other words, it's a double illustration. It's as if when you go under the water, you're identified with Jesus' death. You're dead and buried under the water. Look, you're buried under the water. Brings to my mind a funny time when I did a baptism. Maybe you've heard me tell this story before because I often share it when we do a baptism. One time, uh, uh, Gary Monty and Gene Treerise, they were doing uh, service at an old folks' home, uh, you know, an elderly care living place. And they were, you know, just doing their jobs there. And and, and through some glorious work of God, they were able to, to lead an elderly man to Christ. And this man wanted to be baptized. And apparently they wouldn't let him or they didn't have the facilities at the care home or whatever. And so we were going to do it over at the home of Chuck and Bobby Carlson. And they had a jacuzzi. And so we all gathered there. And the man's family had been praying for this man for years. And how exciting for a man to come to Christ, you know, in his elderly years. And when death is on the horizon, frankly, and and here he comes to Christ. and It's just very exciting. But this man was old and he was kind of frail. You know, and, and when you baptize people, you know, you get a feeling this this man was frail and, and you know that. And so I'm thinking, you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to be mean to this guy. I don't have to put him all the way under, you know, I'll, I'll leave some of his head up out of the water, you know. And so Gary and I were there and, and we go and we take him down. I just I just wanted to be nice to the guy. And so I didn't put him all the way under. I mean, almost. But some of his head, maybe his eyes, you know, didn't really go under. And then I brought him back up and his whole family's happy. And but the man wasn't happy. He looked at me and he said, you didn't put me all the way under. He said, man, I'm here to get baptized and I'm here to go all the way under. And so I said, well, let's do it again. And we did. And we put him all the way under the second time. Well, that's what it's like being identified with Christ. Man, you're buried. You're under the water. But then you come back up again. Friends, every time we do a baptism, we bring the person back up. That's right. It's just like a standing policy that we have. Not, not, not just for their safety's sake, but because the Bible says that not just were we buried with Christ, but we rose again. When he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. Baptism illustrates what happened when we were saved. We were buried with him, and then we rose up to new life. Now, friends, this really helps us to understand something about baptism, is that baptism doesn't save us. You could go out and you could dunk a person under the water a thousand times and lift them back up. But if the spiritual reality hasn't happened with their union with Christ, a trusting, loving union in Jesus, where they put their trust in him and they're identified in his death and they're identified with his resurrection, then all the dunking and water in the world won't change it. 
But Paul's point is clear here. Something dramatic and life-changing has happened in the life of the believer. You can't die and rise again without it changing your life. And so, friends, the believer has a real death and resurrection with Jesus. Now, let me challenge you on a point. It might not seem real to you. And you know why it doesn't seem real? Well, it, there's a possibility that it hasn't truly happened in your life. I don't want to leave that possibility aside. But even for those for whom this death and resurrection with Jesus, this, this spiritual union in his death and resurrection, for, for some of us it doesn't feel real. And do you know why it doesn't feel real? Oftentimes, I can't say this is the reason for everybody, but oftentimes it doesn't feel real to us because it's spiritual. It's a spiritual thing. And sometimes in our heads, we think spiritual does not equal real. Friends, we need to grab on to the spiritual reality of our condition. Just because your identification with Jesus in his death and resurrection is spiritual, it doesn't mean that it's unreal. It's absolutely just as real as if you were nailed to the cross with him and just as real as if you walked out of that open tomb with him. That's how real it is. Don't let Satan tell you that it's not real just because it's spiritual. But I thank God that he knows the weakness of our frame and he gives us tangible material things like baptism so that we can remember. You know, this really happened to me. This is a material illustration of what happened to me spiritually. That's what baptism is all about. So now Paul goes on and he's going to consider the implications of our death and resurrection with Jesus. Starting now at verse 5, he says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now again, he's talking about this close union. Did you see that in verse 5? We have been united together in the likeness of his death. Now, this united together is both in his death and in his resurrection. God has both experiences for us. Friends, I want you to realize that I'm not just talking to you this morning about being crucified with Christ. I want you to grab hold of the fact that you're risen to new life with him as well. Oh, sometimes Christians, we we emphasize just purely or solely the crucified life. Brother, are you living the crucified life? You know, sister, are, are you there? Is it the crucified life? And friends, there's an element of the crucified life for us to live and to experience, to be certain. But at the same time, it doesn't end there. It ends with resurrection life. The crucified life is just the prelude to resurrection life. And so, yes, it may be a valid question. Brother, are you living the crucified life? But I'd better follow it up by saying, are you living the resurrection life as well? Because God has both of those for us. But don't miss the fact, he says this in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. The death of the old man is an established fact. It happened spiritually when we were identified with Jesus' death at our salvation. You say, well, what is this old man business? The old man, biblically speaking, is the self patterned after Adam. We talked about that last week, didn't we? About this sinful nature that we all inherit from Adam. And you don't have to do anything special to get this nature. You're born with it. That sinful nature, this this propensity or inclination to sin that finds itself in us, this, this natural inclination, this deeply ingrained desire to rebel against God and His commands... That's the old man. And God says, you know what I did when you were saved? I took that old man and I nailed him to the cross. Our old man was crucified with him. Our union with Jesus means that the old man was crucified with him. And friends, you see, the the law tries to reform the old man. Sometimes that's what 
you, you feel that God wants you to do, to reform him, to turn over a new leaf, to rehabilitate the old man. But you know, God never has a plan of rehabilitation for the old man. God's plan for the old man is to kill it, crucify it, nail it to the cross. And by the way, might I say that the crucifixion of the old man is something that God does in us. None of us nailed the old man to the cross. God did it when we were saved. And in place of the old man, God gives the believer a new man, not patterned after Adam, patterned after who? Patterned after Jesus himself, a new man that is instinctively obedient and pleasing to God. And that's what we have as believers. A new man in place of the old man. Now notice this. It goes on in verse 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And friends, that's the same pattern in our life. We died a death with Jesus. Now we live a life in Jesus. And it was our death with Jesus, the old man being crucified on the cross, that set us free from sin. The relationship between the believer and sin is changed. You're not just forgiven if you're a Christian. You're not just forgiven if you're born again by the Spirit of God. Your fundamental relationship with sin has been changed. You know, in the 1960 film Spartacus, by the way, we got that movie, we watched it at our house not too long ago. What What a great movie that is. And in that movie, Spartacus, played by Kirk Douglas, there's a line of dialogue there where where somebody asks him if he's afraid to die. And this is what Spartacus said. He said, death is the only freedom that a slave knows. That's why he's not afraid of it. You know, we were slaves to sin. And the only way we could be set free from that slavery to sin is for the old man to die. And now a new man, a free man, lives. And the new life we live, we live unto God. Look at it there in verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. In other words, our life has now lived to God because we've been identified with Jesus in death and in resurrection. Now, I wouldn't blame you if the train of thought that you have as you're following along with me in in this message is, you know, David, this sounds great. Wow, you know. But honestly, it sounds a little pie in the sky. You know, like it's, you know, spiritual principles with nice little clouds around it. But I don't know how it really translates into shoe leather Christian living. And Paul says, I'm glad you asked that because he's going to address that right now in verse 11. He says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. What does God tell us to do? In light of this fact, this spiritual reality that has happened to the believer, it's very simple. He says, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. I find it fascinating that God never tells us to crucify the old man. He never tells you to do that because he says, I did that in you when you came to me. What I want you to do, God says, is reckon the old man dead. Or you could also say this, account the old man as dead. We must account the old man as dead. And I love it. That word account there, it's a financial term. It's an accounting term. He says, you put it down in your ledger, the old man is dead. Now, why is it important for us to do that? Because sometimes it doesn't feel like the old man's dead, does it? 
Now, why doesn't it feel that way? Well, we'll talk about that more next week. It's just a little more than we have time to really get into this morning. And I I hope next week to really explain what about that, because Paul is going to talk next time in the second half of Romans chapter six about what we do with more occasional sin. Let's remember his focus in this question. What about habitual sin? And he says, you have no business living in habitual sin. God did this amazing transformation in your life. It's just unthinkable that you would continue in it. It goes against your nature to be in habitual sin. Before you were a Christian, it went in your nature to be in habitual sin. Now it goes against your nature because you have a new nature. The old man is dead and the new man lives. So you must account the old man as dead. You're identified with Jesus. And that old man is crucified to the cross. So reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. But don't forget to reckon this at the end of verse 11. Also reckon yourself to be alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, we've got that both sides, but not just the crucified life, but the resurrected life as well. Don't only reckon yourself to be dead. Reckon yourself to be alive as well. And when we do that, we can fulfill what he's talking about in verse 12. Therefore... Right. Therefore means he's explaining, he's developing what he's talked about before. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. I wouldn't I wouldn't fault somebody this morning if if right now, as I read that. If a tear sort of welled up in their eye. And they said, Paul, you make it sound so easy. Don't let sin reign. Now, I I wish it was that easy, Paul. What I want you to understand is, no, it's not easy, but it's definitely possible. Ladies and gentlemen, sin does not have to reign in you. You do not have to be in bondage to habitual sin. Period. You can break the power of habitual sin in your life because Jesus Christ has broken the power of it. He did it. When he crucified the old man and your identification with the old man and your resurrection in the new man means that the power of sin is broken. I'm not asking you to break the power of sin in your life. That's been your problem. You've been thinking it's your job to break the power of sin in your life. You've been looking for the old man and trying to nail him to the cross. Forget it. What does God say to you? He says, reckon the old man dead. You account it as being done in Jesus. You recognize that Jesus has done it, that you're identified into his death and in his resurrection. And because of that, the power of sin is broken in your life. And you do not have to be under the dominion of habitual sin. When Paul says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that's something that Paul can only say to the Christian. He can only say it to the person who's born again. If you say that to somebody who's not a Christian, who's not born again by the Spirit of God, who has not had this spiritual identification with the death and resurrection of Jesus, if you were to say it to them, you'd be mocking them. Because the power of sin is alive and unbroken in their life. Only a person who's been set free from sin can be told, do not let sin reign. We truly are free in Jesus Christ. We're free to stop sinning and to live righteously. Because the tyranny of the old man is broken. And so we don't let sin reign in us. But sometimes because of unbelief, because of self-reliance, because of ignorance, many Christians never live in the freedom that Jesus paid for us on the cross. So this is how to walk in this freedom. Look at it right here, verse 13. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. I I better clear something up right here. What does he mean by members? Go members. What is this? A club or something? What are you talking about, Paul? Members is just sort of an old fashioned word for the parts of your body. Here, Paul is getting so practical. You've been aching for Paul to get practical. Here you have it. Therefore, he says, you see that hand of yours? Do not present it as a uh, tool of unrighteousness unto sin. 
Don't do it. You see that eye of yours? Don't you present your eye to the service of sin? That power's broken. What are you doing presenting that as an instrument for unrighteousness? That belongs to God now. We are told to not present the parts of our body to the service of sin. I I like the the New Living Translation on this verse. It, It translates this phrase, Do not let any part of your body become a tool of wickedness to be used for sinning. I'm going to read that again. He says, do not let any part of your body become a tool of wickedness to be used for sinning. That's what he's talking about. So isn't it funny? I have this spiritual, real identification with Jesus. But now, you see this hand? This hand, I have to present it every day unto God and say, God, use this for righteousness. This eye, this this mouth, the tongue that I have to be able to speak words. Every part of my body must be presented to God and for Him to use in His righteousness. You know, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful picture here. In that, If you look at it in verse 13, there's really two parts of it. Don't present the parts of your body as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But it's not just a don't, it's also a do. He says, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. Just show up for service every day to God. You, you bought me. I've identified with you, Jesus. You know, in the Old Testament, there's a beautiful ceremony that took place among the priests of Israel when they were sanctifying and dedicating the priests unto the Lord, where they would take the priests and, and, and they would get sacrificial blood and they would put some of that blood on the ear of the priest. And then they would wipe some of that blood on the thumb of his right hand. And they would wipe some of the sacrificial blood on the big toe of his right foot. And it was a very vivid way of saying, the blood is on your ear, it belongs to God. The blood is on your hand, it belongs to God. The blood is on your foot, it belongs to God. You go where God wants you to go. You do with your hands what God wants you to do. And you listen to God, because all of these things are His purchased possession. And it's the same way for us in Jesus Christ. So friends, it's a beautiful promise. It's beautiful encouragement that we're given. Our bodies must now live to honor God. Your body. See, we're not just talking about spiritual things, so to speak here. God says, let's let's move the spiritual into the material. And this body that you have, stop using it. Stop letting it show up to the service of sin. You present it as an instrument of righteousness to God. And you can do it. You can Because the power of sin is broken in your life. Uh, Let's conclude with verse 14 here. He says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You see, Romans 6.14, I would say, gives us three things. It gives us a test, a promise, and an encouragement. Read it again. For sin shall not have dominion over you, For you're not under law, but under grace. First of all, it's a test of our claim to be Christians. Honestly, friends, does sin have dominion over you? You know, it's a tricky thing that I'm dealing with right here. Because I know that there are people who are genuinely saved And yet they are constantly assaulted by Satan and doubts all the time, telling them, you're not saved. You're not a child of God. God isn't pleased with you. But I know that just as much as that is true, I know that there are people who think they're saved, who assume that they are saved and they are not. And friends, I can think of no greater tragedy than somebody coming to this church week after week and thinking they are saved, assuming they are saved, but never really putting their trust in Jesus Christ, and they would perish for eternity because they they never were confronted with the idea, well, now check yourself to see if you really are in the faith. And I'm going to give you a test right now. Does sin have dominion over you? Can you continue in habitual sin? And honestly, it doesn't really bother you. Now, friends, you know, I believe that that a Christian can get trapped into a habit of sin. But if you're a Christian, it tortures you. You have no peace in your life. You, You may find some strange attraction to your sin, but at the same time, you hate it. Friends, if you are comfortable 
in habitual sin, I want you to strongly consider the possibility that you're not saved. And I, I say that with sadness in my heart. I don't say it to, to discourage. I, I do it to possibly save you from eternal destruction. And so ask yourself, does, does anger have dominion over you? Does, does pride have dominion over you? Does covetousness have dominion over you? Does laziness have dominion over you? If sin has dominion over us, and if we're comfortable there, then friends, you should ask if you're really converted. So this, this is a test for us. But it's also a promise of victory. It, it doesn't say sin will not be present in you. Oh, God doesn't make that promise to us. You know, we're going to deal with sin until our salvation is complete in our resurrection with Jesus. So he doesn't say, for sin shall not be present in you, in verse 14. But he does say, it shall not have dominion over you. And I want that to be a a, a source of hope and a promise unto you today. That that sin really will not have dominion over you. Oh, you've been battling against sin. And and you're discouraged in the struggle. Take this as God's promise to you, that if you are identified in Christ, you're going to have victory. That Jesus Christ is going to come and meet your need. And it's an encouragement and hope and strength for you in the battle against sin. God has not condemned you under the dominion of sin. He set you free in Jesus. And this is great encouragement. It's encouragement for the Christian struggling against sin. It's it's encouragement for the new Christian. It's encouragement for the backslider. He's broken the power of sin in your life and sin shall not have dominion over you. So friends, I think... That Paul's answered his question from Romans 6 1. Why don't we just continue in habitual sin so that grace would abound? Why? Because when we're saved, not only are our sins forgiven, but God's grace is extended to us and we're radically changed. The old man is dead and the new man lives. And in light of these remarkable changes, it's utterly incompatible, utterly incompatible for a new creation in Jesus to be comfortable in habitual sin. A state of sin can only be temporary for the Christian. Charles Spurgeon is credited with saying this, the grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. So here's my question for you. Have you been changed by grace? Now, the changes don't come all at one time, and they may not come to each area of our life at the same time, but they'll be there, and they'll be real, and they'll be increasing as time goes on. Friends, here's the whole key to it. God makes us safe for grace by changing us. That's what he does. He doesn't just say, well, I'll forgive you, and then that's it. He says, no, I'll give you my forgiveness, and I'll change you. I'll give you an inclination to righteousness instead of an inclination to sin. I'll change your heart. I'll crucify the old man. I'll give you a new man. I'll make you safe for grace by changing you. And so since we've died to sin, it's unthinkable that we'd continue to go on living in it. You know, once that caterpillar has been made a butterfly, it doesn't crawl around on trees anymore like a caterpillar. And that's what God's done. He's taken you, the caterpillar, and he's made you a butterfly. Now, what are you doing living like a caterpillar? God says, man, that, that's not for you anymore. You go and fly around. He's giving you wings to fly. So you go for it. So that's my question for you. Have you been changed by grace? <laughs> if you haven't, honestly, if you've heard what we've looked at this morning, you say, I don't think I have been changed by grace. Then receive it today. You don't have to earn it. Put your trust in Jesus. Proclaim your faith in him. Proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord over your life and receive what he did on the cross as payment for your sins. Do that. But friends, I say even more importantly, if you have been changed by grace, then you boldly live it. That's Paul's message to us. You go out and boldly live it. Rejoice in it. Get your face up off the ground. You're a butterfly, for heaven's sakes, not a caterpillar. And when you realize it and rejoice in it and walk boldly in it, God does great things in your life. Father, that's my prayer. First of all, Lord, 
whoever here among us this morning, if they haven't received your life-changing grace, Lord, uh, break down every defense and, and break through right now. And lead that person to, to true faith and to true repentance. And to say, God, change my life by your grace. You know, if that's you right now, tell God so. And uh, put your trust in him. Make a decision right now that Jesus Christ is going to be your Lord and you're going to live for him. Just, just do it. And say, God, I want your life changing grace. Just, just say that if that's you today. But Father, I also want to pray for, for believers this morning that every one of us, if we know that we have been changed by grace, then God help us to all boldly live it. Man, Lord, we're, we're tired of this caterpillar Christian life. Give us wings to fly, Lord. And help us to receive the glorious truth that sin shall not have dominion over us. Thank you for the victory that you won, Jesus, for us on the cross. Bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.